Eric, this has been a, a crazy week, man. The rock was back in Memphis doing a big time promo. Dave Meltzer said, wow, tickets really moved in Memphis. Once they announced the rock was back, he did a little bit of a rock concert talking about Cody's mama. The whole crowd started chanting, whoop that trick, which was, uh, from that movie hustle and flow shout out to those guys. And, uh, then earlier in the week, two days prior to that, we had AEW big business. Mercedes Monet made her big debut finally with AEW. We saw her pull up in the back in a, in a Maybach, and then we saw her in-ring appearance, big promo, little dancing, and then we closed with something we'd never seen before. Not just a ladies match, but I think it was Willow Nightingale's first main event. And I got to be honest, those ladies absolutely tore it up in the main event, but didn't really tear it up in the ratings. Now, of course we did see Sasha, I'm sorry, Mercedes come back out in a new outfit and the whole deal. And there was a big overrun, but of course, when the report came out, everybody says, oh, well, the overrun, we don't have the numbers yet. And I just couldn't help, but wonder, man, what's Eric think about this? Was there a better way to structure the show, to let people know that Mercedes was going to be there at the end because it doesn't feel that way. I mean, her. I think her segment was one of the higher rated segments, but when she comes out at the end, nobody knew she was coming. Nobody expected it. Maybe they should have, but should we have done a better job or what could we have done differently, Eric? The answer is yes. It could have been done differently. It could have, formatting the show is one of Tony's consistent problems. I've talked about it a lot. But I think this past week is an example, and we've seen it e even recently before this week, this past week. We saw it with Okada. And we saw it with Osprey. They, was, they just popped up in the middle of the show. I mean, yes, there was some commentary. There was some narrative from the play-by-play -play and color team earlier on, but it there's no build. There's no, there's no, nothing is done within the format to create anticipation, to hold the audience with an expectation of something exciting happening. That's how you format a show. Your show throughout your one hour or two hours, or in the case of Raw, three hours, ideally, and it's really hard, I don't even want to talk about a three-hour show because that's almost impossible to, to, to be real successful formatting a three-hour show. But even with a two-hour show, the idea is to First of all, in, in, in a best case situation, you want to build on your lead in. So if you've got a million viewers leading into your show, what is the show that uh, comes on before Dynamite? It's like Big Bang Theory or some yeah, shit. Yeah, that sounds all right. Yeah, Big Bang and Theory. And it's a very successful show that does, does great numbers. Well, in an ideal world, you'll take that million those million viewers or 900,000 or whatever the number is, doesn't matter. And you'll build upon it throughout your one hour or two hours of your show. That's what traditionally program executives strive for. Part of that is laying the groundwork. If you know something is going to happen in the main event, something that you want the viewers to stick around and watch, you're building to it. Then you have to kind of lay some groundwork throughout the show. Two or three times in a, in a, in a, in a two hour show would be adequate, would not be overkill. And that can be 15 or 20 second bumpers, sound bites, perhaps an angle. There's a million different ways one could, could achieve it, but you have to plant some Easter eggs, so to speak throughout that two hours to hold on to that audience in anticipation of whatever it is that you are building towards. Failure to do so results in dismal ratings. Again, Osprey, Okada from the week before. That, I mean, supposedly, Tony Khan spent four and a half million dollars a year to get Okada. And look at the numbers. Look at the audience. They did not respond. Now, 
part of that is, I think, because Okada is, I know the, the Kool-Aid drinking AEW snaggletooth hardcore fans are going to, you know, rebel at what I'm about to say, but it doesn't mean it's not right. Okada is, no one knows him outside of the hardest of hardcore wrestling fans, the internet wrestling community, those who worship the ground Dave Meltzer walks on. Nobody knows who the fuck this guy is. So, and that's not a, a reflection on him. It's not his fault. He's been wrestling in an obscure wrestling promotion that no one watches, really. Um, it's incumbent upon Tony and AEW to build him up and to make him feel special. Same with Will Ospreay. They didn't do that week before. And as a result, I think the debut of both, now we've seen Osprey before, obviously, but he's now full-time on the roster. That should have been a cause for celebration. That should have been a big deal. There should be something that's done throughout the show to get us excited about that moment. And there wasn't. Nothing was done. Therefore, no one got excited, and the ratings reflected that. Same thing here with, with uh, Mercedes. I mean... 800,000 viewers on a show where you're bringing in, you know, arguably one of the more recognizable female stars in the wrestling industry who spent, I don't know how many years, a decade in a high profile position within the largest wrestling company in the world. And you bring her into AEW and you get 800,000 viewers. And I know, you know, Dave Meltzer immediately went, well, they didn't advertise her. That's why. Bullshit. Who are you kidding? You know, did, did, it, if, if there was anybody who was a wrestling fan or a fan of AEW who didn't know that Mercedes Monet was going to make her debut in Boston, then I don't know what to tell you. If you if, if people like Dave want to believe that, there's nothing that I'm going to say that's going to change anything for them because they're stuck in this little, they're stuck in a rut, in a small way of thinking, and nothing is ever going to change for them. But the numbers don't lie. 800,000 viewers for Mercedes Monet. I don't know. And I know everybody's, oh, wait, but wait till next week. Now that everybody knows, I got news for you, folks. If that number moves 3 to 5% either way, plus or minus, I'll be surprised. It's And I've said, I said it six months ago when the rumors or whatever it was, four months ago, when the rumors started floating around about Mercedes going to AEW. And the question was, oh, do you think it'll have any impact? My answer was, no, it won't. Just like no one else that's come from WWE has made an impact on the ratings. It's not the talent. The creative, there is no creative. In, there's no functional creative in AEW. I mean, basic television formatting, as we just got discuss, as we just finished discussing, doesn't exist. There's it's unbelievable. It's like a bunch of wrestling fans who've never produced five minutes of television got together and said, hey, let's put on a wrestling show. And they're entertaining themselves, I guess, but not the audience, with the exception of a, a, a nucleus of internet wrestling fans that just love AEW. I don't know, man. It's, it's really sad. I feel bad for the talent. I don't know Sasha Banks, Mercedes. I don't know her. I don't know that I've ever even had a syllable of conversation with her, but I feel bad for her. just like I feel bad for Will Ospreay and Okada and, you know, Christian Cage. And I mean, you look at the roster. Somebody posted a, a an image on social media of all the WWE talent that is on the AEW roster now. I saw that. Was, that was very WCW like, was it not? There was like 24. 25 top talents that that left WWE for whatever reason and are now in AEW. And it's like, what the hell? I don't think I don't know that at the peak of WCW's talent roster, as bloated as it ever became, I don't think we had that many former WWE talents on our roster. And we were delivering five and six and seven million viewers a week. I don't know. It's it's for all of the people that defend Tony, and, oh, he's just so smart. And, you know, Dave Meltzer thinks he's one of the most brilliant people in the world. Are you seeing it? Because I'm sure not. 
I'm I I just don't get it. I've got no dog in the hunt. I don't care. You know, I know there's some great talented people there. I know there's some people there that could help Tony. He doesn't need to go outside of the company. It's all right there at his fingertips. But for whatever reason, he chooses to keep doing things the way he's doing them. And clearly it's not working. You know, and I keep hearing about, oh, you know, the Warner Brothers Discovery, we've got this great relay. They love us. It's never been stronger. I hope that's true. Because if it's not, Tony's going to be looking for a place to hear that show. And I don't know. We'll see. I don't want to be negative. I'm trying not to be, but I'm also trying to be honest in my response and break it down so that it makes sense to people. And it's not just me spewing negative shit, but you have to learn how to format a show. You have to learn how to tell a story. And I mean a real story, not a wrestling angle story or, or one that like John Alba, when I talked to him and he has to, he's looking so deep at what's going on that he's creating a story in his mind to justify feeling good about what's going on. A compelling story is really easy to understand. If I go into a, an elevator with somebody that I know is a wrestling fan and I ask them, Hey, what's the story between wrestler a and wrestler B? What, why, why are they in an angle? What happened? Usually within about two or three floors, Someone can explain to you why, what, what the angle is. What's the backstory? I don't know that you can do that in, in AEW or for AEW without, you know, weed <laughs> or, or something to, to stimulate an imagination and provide you with some, some reasoning that doesn't really exist on television. 